thank you very much, Karush. And um, I, I want to um, thank the organizers for having me. I'm sorry that um, we haven't had a chance to talk more in person. Uh, it's perhaps we're saying that um, I was quite surprised to be invited to talk at this workshop. I'm just a lowly philosopher, and um, I consider myself a student of these developments in um, mathematical physics, but by no means an expert. Um, and so I had to think long and hard about uh, what I could say that might be of interest to this community uh, from whom I have learned so much. And um, what I thought I would try to do is to give you all a sense of um, the one way, at least, in which uh, developments in contemporary mathematical physics are, for my money, of uh, profound philosophical interest and actually critically important for uh, a number of different philosophical projects um, that I'm interested in. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. So, sorry, I can't advance. Okay, so um, to zoom out uh, quite far before zooming in, um, Sellers in uh, the early 1960s, when uh, philosophy took what's been called the naturalistic turn, said that the aim of philosophy abstractly formulated is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. What he was after here is the view that um, philosophy is really uh, subject matter, has a subject matter which is really very broad, um, but there are certain core themes in philosophy which um, have been of perennial interest and which remain so. And um, so if one is interested in particular in how the world hangs together at what philosophers call the fundamental level uh, or the level of reality from which all other uh, matter is constituted, then they're naturally drawn to quantum field theory for the reason that it is uh, of the empirically supported theories that we have, it is uh, it lies at the most fundamental level. It's the most basic elements of reality, which the project of science has uh, been able to uncover. And so if one is interested in that question of uh, what the world is constituted of, um, quantum field theory is a particularly natural place to look. And uh, as I think I mentioned on Monday, um, another thing that's been especially impressive is the level of agreement between uh, theory and experiment. So um, what I show here is the, uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, the current best theoretical value, though there may be another uh, term now, uh, not certain, um, for the anomalous electron magnetic moment, um, which includes uh, uh, four or five orders of uh, QED, as well as um, an, uh, leading corrections from hadronic uh, and weak physics. And then uh, the best experimental value as well. And um, agreement between theory and experiment to 10 or 11 decimal places uh, is taken to be an indication that there's something uh, about the theoretical structure of quantum field theory, which is related in some important way to the structure of the world. If that weren't the case, uh, it would be genuinely surprising that, um, uh, that there's an agreement at this level of precision. Okay, so uh, the structure line behind the, success, the theoretical prediction seems like the best available guide that we're going to have uh, about how things hang together at the fundamental level. And so if one is philosophically minded and they're interested in that question, they're naturally guided to ask what that structure is. And what one finds if you open up a physics textbook concerning quantum field theory typically is a perturbative evaluation of um, uh, cross sections or rates or other observables in first QED and then uh, other theories or perhaps another toy model. 
And um, what one first notices is that the way that this theory is elaborated, at least in the textbook literature, the physics textbook literature, bears some marked dissimilarities from the way that um, other uh, theories that philosophers have been interested in uh, appear. And in particular, um, as one learns to calculate their preferred quantities of interest, um, the individual, the perhaps the first order of perturbation theory is well behaved. And then uh, after one learns how to calculate the next order, one finds these loops, uh, which give rise to ultraviolet divergences. One finds uh, soft photon divergences in the final state. And um, perhaps uh, if one's lucky, one will be told in their quantum field theory course that at the large orders of perturbation theory, even if one can come to understand uh, what's going on at the relatively low orders of perturbation theory, uh, the, the series in question still diverges. Okay. So there's a number of problems here. Um, we've got uh, a perturbative evaluation of say the S matrix. Um, we might get one finite term, but each of the subsequent terms in the series are infinite because of ultraviolet and infrared divergences. One learns the techniques of regularization and uh, renormalization in the physics literature. And that uh, if one is uh, lucky is sufficient to give uh, finite terms for every order of perturbation theory. Uh, but then uh, the bad news is that then you, once you try to sum that formal power series, what one gets is a large order divergence. Okay, so um, if one is philosophically inclined and encounters this situation, it's really difficult to understand uh, what the structure of the theory in question is supposed to be, because this sort of perturbative evaluation, which is beset with all three of these sources of infinities, just don't match onto the kinds of stories that philosophers have uh, are accustomed to tell about um, the nature of scientific theory. So. Um, Briefly, it's perhaps worth uh, noting that two views of um, uh, the nature of scientific theories have kind of dominated uh, the discussions of this issue in the literature. So on the one hand, there's what's called the syntactic view, which holds that theories are collections of sentences. So sentences, which you can imagine are the sentences expressing uh, the, the core content of the theory. If a theory is elaborated axiomatically, then it will be the axioms of the theory that constitute the sentences in question. Um, and then on the other hand, the semantic view, which holds that theories are collections of models. Okay, so um, there's debates about whether one or another of these are correct. I won't, um, go into too much detail about uh, the, the nature of the, the connection between the views and why one might prefer uh, one to the other, but I'll let it suffice to say that if what one has in mind as the structure of quantum field theory is this perturbative evaluation of uh, observables that one finds in the textbooks, you just simply don't have a, a, syntax, a theory according to the syntactic view, and you don't have a theory according to the semantic view either, because it's not clear how to identify uh, models in the sense that philosophers are interested in. Um, so let me just give you a few kind of characteristic uh, remarks about this situation that I think kind of illustrate the reaction that philosophers have had to the realization that um, this is the mathematical state of quantum field theory as it's expressed in the physics literature. So um, here's Hans Halverson. He says that philosophers of physics have taken their object of study to be theories where theories correspond to mathematical objects, perhaps sets of models. Uh, but it's not so clear where quantum field theory can be located in the mathematical universe. And then he goes on to say, in the absence of some sort of mathematically intelligible description of QFT, the philosopher of physics has two options, 
either find a new way to understand the task of interpretation or remain silent about the interpretation of quantum field theory. Okay, so what's on offer, what, what Halverson is saying is we don't have in standardly elaborated uh, perturbative field theory, the kind of thing that philosophers know how to tell their normal, normal interpretive stories about. And so if what you thought you were going to get from quantum field theory is a story about how the world might be at its fundamental level, um, the resources of perturbative field theory aren't the right kind of thing to tell that story. So either we need to just give up and confess that quantum field theory can't function as such a guide, or we need to find a different way uh, to approach um, the interpretation of the theory, or to put it another way, we need to find a different way to think about how to arrive at a picture of the world on the basis of the success of the perturbative expansion. So here's another characteristic remark and one which I, I want to try to face up to a bit uh, in what we'll find going forward. So Richie says, um, given the theory T, we confront the exemplary interpretive question of how exactly to establish a correspondence between T's models and worlds possible according to T. That is, we confront that question if T is the sort of thing that has models a collection of partially heuristic technical developments, that's a reference to um, a statement Siegel made in the early 1950s, isn't readily attributed a set of models about whose underlying ontology or principles of individuation philosophical questions immediately arise. This isn't to say that a collection of partially heuristic technical developments is unworthy of philosophical attention, it is in itself a philosophically provocative circumstance that such a collection can enjoy stunning empirical success. So what I want to do here is tell you one story about how developments in uh, the mathematical physics literature and in particular epstein glaser renormalization provide the resources to face up to this uh, philosophically provocative circumstance that Richie is appealing to. Um, in particular, I think uh, it gives us, epstein glaser renormalization gives us the ability to be able to um, answer how it can be that in face of at least one of the mathematical difficulties with the theory that I pointed to, um, that uh, the theory can still be empirically, as empirically successful as it is. So here's a natural question that one might have in face of the difficulties that I've pointed to. How can such a broken theory be so profoundly empirically successful? Um, and a natural inclination is, can we separate out what we're getting right from what seems to be going wrong with the theory? So what I'm gonna do is just I report to you the standard story about perturbative uh, field theory that I encountered when I was learning field theory in a uh, physics department. I don't know how many of you entered uh, field theory from that direction. Um, and so I want to just report to you uh, the kinds of um, uh, things that people say in that context. So um, first thing one might be told is that the infrared and large order divergences are conceptually unproblematic. I found this quite uh, difficult to understand, um, uh, but that's uh, what it, in many textbook treatments of um, uh, perturbative field theory, these issues don't even get addressed. Uh, the ultraviolet divergences, we're told, result from the theory treating arbitrarily short distances. And um, we have uh, cases of uh, in loop integrals going like one over um, the momentum up to some uh, infinite uh, value. And so we get divergences uh, 
but we can uh, regularize those divergences by imposing uh, ultraviolet cutoff, and uh, that yields a finite value of the integral for finite values of the cutoff. And then we can study the behavior of the theory uh, as um, we let the cutoff go back to infinity, and we can determine redefinitions of parameters in the theory, the charges and masses, uh, that allow us to generate a collection of infinite counter terms to add to the Lagrangian. And um, power counting methods show us how, to, uh, how many counter terms we're going to require in order to render the theory ultraviolet finite. And we get a hierarchy of the super renormalizable, uh, perturbatively renormalizable, and then the non renormalizable theories. In the perturbatively renormalizable theories, uh, we learn that only a finite number of redefinitions of uh, parameters in the theory are required, and those parameters can be fixed with experimental data. For this reason, initially, non-renormalizable theories were thought to be particularly mathematically problematic because they require an infinite amount of empirical data in order to be rendered uh, perturbatively finite to all orders of perturbation theory. And if we assume that somehow infrared divergences are also handled during this process, the output of the standard renormalization procedure is a well-defined formal power series, which um, we have good arguments uh, will go on to diverge. But now the textbook physics story continues. Uh, renormalization was once rightly regarded with suspicion and um, many of the architects of perturbative field theory have expressed suspicion about this very issue. Uh, but now we know how to do better. Now we know how to uh, treat the, at least the ultraviolet regime of the theory in a way which is better physically motivated and which uh, uh, get render, gives some sense to what seems to be an ad hoc uh, sort of renormalization procedure um, in its initial uh, form. Okay, so to kind of complete the standard story, uh, what we're told is that the renormalization group uh, provides a physically well-motivated account of why renormalization is required. And moreover, um, understanding uh, the details of renormalization has led to novel empirical predictions such as, such as the scaling behavior um, that we find in both QED and QCD. Okay. So that's all I'll say about the kind of standard physics story about the bad mathematical behavior of perturbative quantum field theory. And now what I want to do is uh, kind of think about two different ways that you might go about adjusting the language of a theory um, in face of difficulties of the sort that we seem to be encountering here. So, one thing you might do is to completely recast the theory um, and search for a model of the recasted theory um, that uh, shows the principles constitutive of this new theory to be uh, consistent. So I take it that at least in the early stages of um, the, the Whiteman axioms and uh, the Hagraki-Kassler Hagraki -Kassler axioms, this was basically the strategy that was being pursued. People were um, saying, okay, look, we've got a theory that's mathematically poorly behaved. What should we do? Well, we, let's try to articulate principles which capture the content of what we were trying to say when we initially articulated the theory and do so in a mathematically precise way. And then once we've got a mathematically precise collection of axioms, we can search for models. And um, if we turn out to find models that uh, satisfy the axioms, that shows that those principles are consistent. And it shows somehow that there was some sort of global um, ill-definedness to the way the principles of the theory had been articulated in the first instance. And that's uh, why we needed to move to this more mathematically precise setting. 
But this recasting kind of strategy is global in nature in the sense that uh, it really appeals to um, the whole, the, to, to rewriting the whole uh, articulation of the theory from scratch. Um, and I guess it's worth saying that uh, of philosophers who've paid attention to these issues in contemporary um, field theory, uh, this is by default uh, the sort of strategy that they tend to look to because you can tell standard philosophical accounts of uh, about the nature of theories about these recasted theories. So if I work in the Whiteman axioms or if I work in the Hagaraki Kassler axioms, what I find is that I get a story about the structure of the theory that neatly ties into the way that philosophers think about the structure of theories. And so there's been a lot of philosophical work in, in particular in the algebraic uh, quantum field theory tradition um, concerning uh, uh, various principles. But a worry about this sort of recasting approach um, stems from the level of difficulty that uh, we've had in terms of generating realistic interacting models in four dimensions. So um, remember what we're after here is a story about how the world hangs together at the fundamental level. And so um, it's fine, uh, uh, the results that show that uh, these various systems of axioms are consistent or great mathematical results, and they point us in the direction of what um, an account of what the world might actually look like at its fundamental level. However, that sort of strategy doesn't by itself attach it to the empirical success of things like QED, um, which are what so impressed philosophers um, in the first instance as kind of a guide to what the fundamental level of reality might look like. And so um, in the absence of a demonstration that uh, QED satisfies one of these, or QCD or what, pick your preferred um, empirically adequate field theory, uh, satisfies um, some collection of axioms, it's just not so obvious that um, it's going to, this is the sort of story that's going to work in order to um, fill in the philosopher's hope of getting a story about what the world looks like at the fundamental level. But there's another approach to thinking about how to uh, adjust a language in the face of the sorts of difficulties that we confront, confront in perturbative field theory, um, which I'm gonna call repair, which is that um, one might also attempt to more directly identify the source of the difficulties in the language of the theory as it was originally articulated and repair it. So um, the contrast here is uh, with the recasting approach is that rather than just globally rewriting the whole set of principles constitutive of the theory, what we're going to do is to look more locally um, at the particular ways in which the standard perturbative calculations go wrong and give rise to infinities and then try to repair the language, understand the source of those infinities and then uh, repair the language so that they don't arise from the outset. Okay. What I wanna suggest here is that um, this approach has actually played a really important role in understanding the status of perturbative ultraviolet divergences in quantum field theory. <clears throat> so here's a question that I want to um, uh, pose and then uh, answer. So if renormalization is about describing a real physical process, which is what the kind of out upshot of the standard story uh, is, why, and, and it's not fundamentally about canceling divergences um, in an ad hoc way, why are those divergences present in the theory at all? Um, I think this is a natural question that occurs to many students of field theory. Um, can't we just write down a completely finite theory from, in the ultraviolet from the outset? Um, and in order to answer that question, uh, we first need to understand the origin of the uh, perturbative ultraviolet divergences. 
So what I want to tell you here is a story which I take it is familiar to uh, many people in the audience. And so I won't belabor the, the details of the strategy of Epstein Glaser renormalization. Uh, what I want to try to do is simply bring out um, why that story is important for the kind of philosophical thread that I've been developing here. So the alternative story goes that uh, this renormalization procedure is required in order to resolve ambiguities stemming from the distributional character of field theoretic expressions, okay? So um, the original architects of field theory, so think of the late 1940s and the development of covariant uh, perturbation theory for quantum electrodynamics, uh, Schwinger, Feynman, Dyson, they didn't realize that the expressions they were writing contained uh, distributions in a sense that I'll make clear in a moment, um, uh, because a systematic theory of such objects was not available. Objects like distributions were being written down and delta functions were being written down in, the, uh, in some of the relevant equations, um, but there was no systematic theory of distributions uh, available to the physics community during the period when covariant perturbation theory was being developed in the late 1940s. And so um, th those figures really didn't have a choice but to just um, uh, march ahead and uh, write down expressions which um, ultimately turned out to be ill-defined because uh, the objects in question did turn out to be distributional in character. And this led to problems and it led to problems because, uh, as I take it most many of you will know, products and divisions of objects which are distributional in character can lead to ambiguities if one isn't very um, careful about the nature of the singular support of those distributions, okay? But what's important for our story is just that um, just because some expression is ambiguous uh, doesn't entail that it's meaningless, okay? And the story of epstein glaser renormalization, as I understand it, is the story of how to move from uh, taking expressions in standard perturbative field theory, which one might worry are in fact meaningless because we're just subtracting infinite quantities in an uncareful, ill-defined way, um, and diagnosing the source of those infinities, uh, understanding that they come from these ambiguous distribution theoretic expressions, uh, and then um, showing how to resolve the nature of that ambiguity in a way uh, which recovers the results of standard um, perturbation theory. And um, uh, that's what I'm going to explain uh, here. So the first um, uh, person or collection of group of people to seem, who seem to have latched on to this as a strategy um, were a group around uh, Stuckelberg who explicitly really realized that the ambiguities um, in the perturbation series stem from products and divisions of distributions. There's a very interesting historical story to tell. I won't, for reasons of time, go into it in detail here, though I think it's um, very important. Um, but uh, upon that realization um, and further developments by Bogol Yubov and um, other members of his group, um, uh, Epstein and Glazer were able to link a causality condition introduced by, uh, in one version by Stuckelberg and his group, and in another version by Bogolubov, um, and to connect that ambiguity in the causality condition uh, to these distribution theoretic ambiguities. What one finds once one produces their construction is that the standard perturbative uh, uh, evaluation of the S matrix elements in terms of time order products of the fields can be carried over very naturally into um, a perturbative uh, evaluation of the order by order evaluation of the S matrix, um, where now uh, the quantity of interest is a time ordered product of what are properly regarded as distributions whose singular supports are carefully uh, considered and controlled. 
And the aim of the causal perturbation theory program began to introduce an order by order construction um, of the S matrix where each of the SNs is a well-defined operator value distribution. So what one finds when they produce this construction, as I expect many of you know, is that um, the elements, the, the individual orders of the S matrix aren't quite regular um, distributions. Um, they're um, missing the origin. And so we almost get regular distributions, but not quite. And a natural question is, can we uniquely extend those distributions to regular distributions? To answer that question, uh, we need a measure of the singularity of a distribution at the origin for which um, this notion of a scaling degree was introduced. Um, and this scaling degree, um, I think, uh, importantly, makes sense of what's going on in the power counting arguments that physicists are taught to generate in order to understand uh, the superficial degree of, de degree of divergence of um, uh, the graphs in their expansion. Um, and once one introduces the scaling degree, uh, what one finds is that um, if uh, your T0 is some distribution with a scaling degree less than n, there's some unique distribution T with uh, a, the same scaling degree that uniquely extends um, T0. So what about when uh, the scaling degree is greater than or equal to N? Then there's not a unique extension, but there is a unique extension of uh, T0 plus um, uh, terms which uh, consists of coefficients multiplied by uh, derivatives of the delta distribution. And so to produce a unique extension of that distribution, we need to fix a finite set of numbers, the C alpha. But now um, these are just analogs of the counter terms that we introduce in the standard story. Um, but importantly, when we uh, proceed in this way, um, what we find is that um, no infinities have actually arised that from the ultraviolet uh, regime of the theory at any stage in the calculation. Okay, so unlike in the standard uh, story that I told you where we generate a divergence and then cancel it with an infinite counter term and introduce this dubious kind of ad hoc cancellation, in this case, um, we naturally uh, produce ambiguities um, at, uh, fr from the origin, and we need, to, in order to extend the distributions to regular distributions, we need to fix some set of constants. Okay, and this makes mathematical sense of uh, the of what went wrong in the in the perturbative, uh, the standard physics perturbative uh, case. Moreover, uh, you can even recover the scaling behavior in this formalism. So you can recoup um, the, the novel empirical success of uh, the renormalization group um, along these lines as well. So what causal perturbation theory shows us how to do is how to write down a perturbatively ultraviolet finite theory from the outset without ever incurring divergences at all. And uh, what that importantly demonstrates for the purposes of um, uh, the story I'm telling is uh, that um, the perturbative ultraviolet divergences that occur in the standard story are merely artifacts of the wrong choice of mathematical objects. And as I said, that wrong choice of mathematical objects was sort of forced on uh, uh, the original architects of the theory because there was no systematic um, uh, theory of the correct objects available to them at the time that they were developing covariant perturbation theory. Okay, just in the last uh, few minutes in order to wrap up, let me just kind of um, uh, explain how these threads all come together in the end. So, what I introduced you to were the difficulties that the physicists first encountered in developing perturbative quantum field theory. And uh, philosophers have been interested in um, using 
that structure, which enjoys this uh, robust empirical success for telling the story about what the structure of the world looks like at the fundamental level as best as we've been able to uncover it. Um, and so the strategy they've been motivated by is to look for some theory that completely recasts the perturbative, um, the principles that's constitutive of uh, the perturbative field theory in a way that um, makes it possible to show the, those principles to be consistent. The worry that I expressed about that strategy is that um, because the uh, model, the empirically interesting interacting models in four dimensions haven't been shown to be uh, models of any of those sets of axioms, it's just not so clear that we've got a rigorous argument that the empirical success um, that the perturbative uh, theory enjoys um, actually also accrues to those uh, recasted models in the axiomatic frameworks. And um, one, obviously with more work, it might eventually be shown how to make that connection. Uh, but uh, so far as I'm aware, we don't yet have such a connection. And what I've told is an alternative story about how white one might go about um, trying to di more directly identify the local sources of the difficulties in the language of the theory as it was originally articulated and to go about repairing it. And that's what I take it causal perturbation theory allows one to do. It allows us to identify these local sources of um, the bad mathematical behavior in the case of the perturbative ultraviolet divergences. Um, there are, of course, remain other uh, mathematical challenges with the theory which need to be addressed by other means. Um, but for this reason, I think that um, causal perturbation theory actually provides us with the resources to address Richie's question. So remember, um, her concern was with how it could be that um, a theory which was so badly mathematically behaved could enjoy such stunning empirical success. Um, on its face, that seems a bit mysterious um, if one's coming uh, uh, with, um, along with the sorts of uh, pre-commitments that uh, many philosophers do. And in order to face up to that question, um, I think what causal perturbation theory provides us with are the resources to show that at least in the case of the perturbative ultraviolet divergences, these are merely artifacts. Um, and uh, we now have um, in the CPT program, uh, uh, a way to cleanly um, construct order by order the S matrix in an ultraviolet finite perturbatively ultrafinite way, ultraviolet finite way um, to any order of perturbation theory that one likes. Um, and I think that provides us with the resources to face up to Richie's question. And uh, I'll leave off there. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Oh. Okay, so there was some. Just, just a second. Okay, so um, I suggest we continue with the discussion by Jose Garcia Bondia, and then maybe we we open the talk to some discussions from the audience. Okay. Thank you. And then share the screen.
So hello, everybody. Um, Professor Miller has written a lot of formulas. So instead, I will, I, I don't have, I don't feel the need to, to add more formulas. So no formulas in this um, intervention. Um, I also, I will be brief because uh, if the discussion takes the 20 minutes, then uh, there is no discussion really. So, so let me start my comment on the talk by Professor M Miller by a phrase by a philosopher, by Hegel. Um, the all of wisdom only starts, only starts to, its flight uh, at the end of the day. This, of course, um, is telling us that, uh, and it is completely natural, philosophers, they come after the developments. But it doesn't mean that their role is less important. And I think there is every reason to cheer the presence of Professor uh, Doherty and Professor Miller here. Uh, let me clear a misunderstanding. Quantum field theory is sometimes thought as a relatively recent development. This is not so. Quantum field theory is almost as old as quantum mechanics itself. So one or two years after the basic papers of, of uh, quantum mechanics, Jordan, Wigner, and Dirac were already doing quantum field theory. Means that in a matter of four years, perhaps no more, quantum field theory will be one century old. Uh, trouble is that the philosophers have been paying attention to and thinkers to quantum mechanics for a good while. Who hasn't heard about the Schrodinger cat? But only now we are start to turn to turn towards the strangeness of quantum field theory. And quantum field theory is much more weirder using uh, Shakespeare words than uh, quantum mechanics. The famous Redinger cut, well, this is a matter of a state which is entangled. Trouble is, in quantum field theory, it's not only the states which are entangled, but the physical quantities, the, the observables are entangled. Uh, okay, uh, I think that Professor Miller is 100% right in understanding the establishment of stained glass theory as a philosophical enterprise. And I will limit myself to some historical remarks. So as he said, von Stickelberg, with the help of uh, Rivier and Peterman in the early 50s, there are some papers by von Stickelberg which are prior to the one that we were shown by Professor Miller, um, he established this foundation. By the way, von Stiegelberg used to write in German till 45. I wonder why he changed to other languages after that. Uh, Bogoliubov was a keen reader of French and even before writing the uh, paper with Parasuk that has been also mentioned, he had absor absorbed the ideas of von Stickelberg, and in Russian, he made his own, uh, I mean, he started his own development. And then there is, of course, his famous book with Sirkov, which came uh, relatively soon afterwards, in which the functional scattering matrix, which is the heart of, uh, of uh, the, the theory, I mean, of Epstein glass theory, was already introduced. The paper by Epstein and Glasser appeared in the uh, Annal Henri Poincaré of uh, the year 73 of last century. Uh, the paper is a classic and it's uh, almost perfect. So it seems uh, to have appeared also like uh, Minerva from the head of Jupiter. But let me tell you that this was not the case in the sense that it took long in preparation. 
It was preceded by many discussions, many drafts, several uh, talks by the authors, starting probably earlier, but at least that I can recall uh, at ISTP of Trieste in 69. And then there were very important three rencontres of, the, of Strasbourg in the years uh, that follow. And also several uh, interventions at CERN by Glasser. Glasser was based uh, at CERN in the 60s uh, on the adiabatic limit in Bogolivo metrics, which is a, a technical uh, subject in Epstein Glasser theory, but a very important one. Only after such longer preparations, a paper like that can be born. Uh, it is very interesting to remark that. Neither Glasser, who was busy at CERN with other things and, and disappeared relatively soon, nor Henry Epstein, who is still with us despite COVID, uh, came back to the subject. The torch was picked up uh, most importantly and almost at once by Raymond Estora, who introduced his geometrical lemma, geometrical lemma of Estora, which originally was an Euclidean um, contraption uh, allows a systematic way of, of making the, the preparations of which Professor Miller talked. So there is actually, you know, a, a kind of a procedure that you can follow. Uh, Stora was the main authority in Epstein Glasser theory, this his, his, his disappearance. By the way, uh, this. Uh, Geometrical lemma, as I say, is Euclidean, but in relatively recent work with Todorov and Nikolov, like seven or eight years ago, he had the time to, to do it Minkowski. Um, I will I introduce another citation. Um, in 198 of the last century, uh, Stora got the a Regensburg in, here in Germany. Sorry, we are not in Germany but was said we are on the same river, on the Danube. Uh, Estora made us a gift of another remarkable citation, which I love. One to three theories by now, an old lady with a hard skin and a tough core, malicious and tricky. Well, leaving aside a, a bit of sexism, this is no joke. It reflects the present situation in which we have many contending, but hopefully not contradictory approaches. Many of them have been uh, dealt with in this conference. That's, of course, the strong point of this meeting. Constructive field theory, stochastic quantization, algebraic field theory based on von Neumann algebras, modular theory, the talk by Dunn on resurgence theory methods, that I was listening to for the second time. It's splendid. Hoff algebraic methods, of course. And then uh, string local fields, as I was talking about the other day, were introduced by Jess Moons, Schroer, uh, and Invaso. Uh, actually, in spite of the scope of this long paper, much, much business was left uh, to be done besides the adiabatic limit for couplings with massless fields. For instance, uh, the integral formula, which is given in the original paper, turned out to be insufficient when zero mass particles are emitted. So we, we were finishing a paper about the diphoton decay of the Higgs, which is the easiest way for now to, to uh, understand the properties of Higgs that won't be that in the future when there are other luminosities and energies at CERN. But by now, uh, diphoton decay is the best way to study, for instance, the mass of the Higgs. And we had this another nasty little surprise that uh, zero mass particles, I mean, this is a, a, a decay that emits uh, photons back to back, and that this wasn't really treated in the original paper. So we have to, to work this out. To finish my story, the flame was kept first for a long while for by Scharf's Schurich School, the flame of stained glass theory, I mean, then by the Hamburg School, which 
I think it was very well represented by Cassia last week. This is a very ambitious program for a background independent off-shell functional Epstein Glacier framework, which moreover, moreover uh, goes all the way, uh, all the way uh, from classical field theory using Moyal quantization. Uh, I would say that there is a person who represents both school, which is Michael Deutsch. By the way, I recommend his book. He belonged to the Zurich school and now to the Hamburg school. And then the flame was kept also by Storach himself, Ivan Todorov, and there is a powerful Moscow school about Khachov, uh, around Khachov, I mean, of which I have heard less uh, recently, but that might be my ignorance. I am done.